So uh, this evening, the discussion is going to be Pure Land Teachings in Tendai. And as you, as everyone here knows, we're in the middle of Gyo. And this was one of the, um, and a Gyo, for those who don't know, is comes from the term Shugyo, which means ascetic training. So it's, it's not the acquisition of knowledge so much as it is learning to train the body to do the things. And um, this will be finished on Sunday, and so they'll finish Sunday morning, and then we have the Maha Sangha Sunday <coughs> gathering at 10.30 on Sunday, so everyone is aware of that. And there's a potluck after that, and the people who have been on Yo um, look forward to having something other than whatever we've been. And by the way, for people who don't know, Christina's been doing some of the cooking, so it's been oh. Christina and Tamami. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Thank you. So this, what I was starting to say is the topic is something I wanted to cover during the go, and I thought that I would do two things at once by doing it for the discussion tonight, then the go attendees get to participate in seeing that. Uh, the topic itself is pretty complex. It's complex as Majamika or Yogacara uh, teachings, and so I, you want to limit the scope of the material. It can go in a lot of different ways. And so I'll focus specifically on Pure Land teachings as it, they relate to Tiantai and Tendai with a little bit of background to give it context. Next, please. And so we're going to start with what is the Pure Land. Uh, and I want to start by looking at this picture uh, that's going to be there. And that particular picture is of Yodoin, the Temple of Equality. That's the Phoenix Hall at Yodoin Temple in the city of Uji in Kyoto. And it's a temple that is jointly run by, Kyoto, by Jodo Shu, Pure Land Buddhism in Japan, and Tendai Shu sects. So it's a temple that belongs to both, both groups. Uh, the Paradise Gardens appear that you see in the foreground in front of the temple, appeared in the late Heian period, and they were created by nobles belonging to a Mita Buddhist sect. And that'll make more sense in a minute. And they were meant to symbolize paradise or the Pure Land, Jodo, where the Buddha sat on a platform contemplating a lotus pond. And these gardens featured a lake island called Nakajima, where the Buddha Hall was located, connected to the shore by an arching bridge. The most famous surviving example is seen in this picture the Garden of the Phoenix Hall of Yodoin. It was built in 1053. Next, and, and so, well, not, not next, say where you are. <laughs> As an overview, the Pure Land was a Buddha field purified of transgressions and sufferings by a Buddha, and an auspicious place in which to take rebirth. It's also a specified place, the most famous of these fields, that of the Buddha Amitabha, which is the Western paradise, named Sukhavati. And a tradition of texts and practices in Mahayana Buddhism dedicated to the description of a number of these places and practices to ensure rebirth in the Pure Land. And as it says in the Kamakura era, it was the fo single focus of the Jodoshu and Jodoshinshu schools of Japanese Buddhism. And for those that don't know, Jodoshinshu is the single largest school of Buddhism in Japan. And there are probably more Pure Land practitioners in Asia than any other school of Buddhism altogether. Next, please. When it comes to Tendai, we see here uh, in this picture, which I think really symbolizes something that's important in relation to Tendai, and that is that those two halls, the Jogyodo and the Hokkaido uh, of Enrakuji on, on Hiezan, um, I wanted to start with this because the you see an elevated walkway between the two, and they join those two particular halls, um, thus composing a single hall called Ninaido Hall. The building on the left, Jogyodo, is the Lotus. I'm sorry, I'm, that I've got it mixed up. Anyway, the Jogyodo uh, is where the 100-day Jodo practice. Circumambulating, circumambulating Amida while reciting Nembutsu takes place. And the uh, Hokido uh, Hall 
is where 100 day practices of Shikan or Shamata and Vipassana uh, are conducted. During the early years of Mahayana development, it was articulated that the Buddhas did not simply go into extinction, but remained active in the world. And for those who might not recognize what that means, in the Theravadan concept, <coughs> once Buddha died, the historical character Shakyamuni Buddha died, that was it. He was no longer present. Mahayana sort of changed that around and was articulated that he then goes on to remain, meaning Buddha, goes on to remain active in the world and helps those who are stuck in dukkha, which is literally all of us. Yeah. Um, it followed that these places they dwell to in must reflect purity of their own wisdom. The idea of the Buddha fields came into being. So the Buddha fields were an idea, the pure land came out of that idea originally. The Buddha land known as Sukhavati is the Western paradise, land of bliss, ruled over by Amitabha. And that became predominant in popular culture in India and then later in East Asia and Tibet. The longer Sukhavati Sutra was compiled uh, in the Kushan Empire during the first and second centuries CE by an order of Mahasisakas, monastics who flourished in the Gandhara region. That's the region that today we refer to as Pakistan and parts of Afghanistan up in that part of the world. Um, and Nagarjuna, the founder of Majamaka school of Indian Mahayana Buddhism is credited with when I, when I say, you know, I say founder of the Mah uh, Majamaka school, and, and he, he was, that's a little bit, I won't go there, that's a long story by itself. Anyway, um, he's credited with writing the commentary on the 10 stage sutra, a sutra which is actually a chapter in the Avatamsaka or Flower Garland Sutra, uh, in which there is said that there was a difficult way of attaining enlightenment through self cultivation i.e. sitting meditation, and an easy way of attaining enlightenment by thinking of and calling upon the names of the Buddha of the Ten Directions. So you've got the tough way and you've got the easy way. It sounds like a, a uh, Clint Eastwood film. Anyway, so Vasubandhu, one of the founders of the Indian Yogacara school of Buddhism, is credited with writing the hymns of aspiration for birth in the Pure Land, which is also known as the Discourses on the Pure Land, where its auto-commentary is included. The Hymns of Aspiration for Birth is a commentary on the Sutra of the Buddha of Infinite Life, and it emphasizes the visualization of Amitabha Buddha, the merit contained in his name. In other words, where I'm going with this is that this idea of the Pure Land is very early. This is not something that pops up much later. It's very early in the history of Buddhism. It's starting in the first and second centuries. Um, the, there was no Pure Land school per se, as there was, there were, there were, we refer to, uh, there were two practice and two doctrinal schools, but in fact, they weren't schools the way we think of schools or sects today. When we talked about the, the, Doctrinal schools, that was Tiantai, from which Tendai is descended, and Hua Hien, from which Japanese Kegon is descended. One based upon the Lotus Sutra, one based upon the Upantamsaka Sutra. The two practice schools were Cha'an, which of course becomes Zen in Japan, and Pure Land. Now, the way we see Pure Land today through Jodo Shinsho, we don't think of it as a practice school. They don't have a set of practices. Jodo Shu, which is also Pure Land School, does have a set of practices, but Shinshu, the largest school in Japan, does not. That is to say, they don't sit meditation, they would shoe meditation. They will chant um, very, they will chant during a service, but it's not a regular feature of the tradition as it is in Jodo Shu. Jodo Shu requires um, a chanting practice. And the other aspect of that is that when I said that it wasn't a school in the sense that Tendai or Hua Hien is a school, um, it was really a specific teaching lineage. And 
there were social and religious movements at various points in Chinese history. And so it was a, it was a current of thought, the Pure Lands, which developed practices which had many adherents, but there was never a, an active um, set of monasteries that were devoted to that with a hierarchy and all that sort of thing. There was more a, a school in terms of, of contexts. The Pure Land practices had both an exoteric and an esoteric component. The esoteric means the, um, the if, you, if you came to see the Goma, last, um, that was on Saturday, Sunday. Sunday. Sunday, that's an esoteric practice. When we do the Go Shimbo at the beginning of a service, that's an esoteric practice. Use of mudras, mantras, visualizations. Uh, eso exoteric are the doctrinal teachings. So that's really going into the, the literature and that sort of thing. Um, so Pure Land has both of those things. And we find that circumambulating Nembutsu while reciting in Chinese, it would be Abitapu. In Japanese, it would be Namo Mirabutsu. While walking around a statue or an image of a Mita Buddha would be one of those practices. And as an esoteric practice, one would visualize a Mita Buddha while doing that. That would be considered an esoteric practice. Next, please. Tiantai, I, I really like this picture. It's just so dramatic to see the temple at the top of that, of that mountain with a long pathway that you have to climb to get up there. I mean, you really want to go to that temple. That's not one that you just stop by on your way someplace else, right? Um, the founder of the Tiantai school uh, in China is Qi Gi. You see his picture on the left there. Um, the prop... Pratyapana Sutra, translated by Lokashima in 147 CE, to give you a, a context of time here, contains the first known mention of the Buddha Amitabha in his Pure Land, thought to be the origin of Pure Land practice in China. And based upon this text, a group of clergy at the Tonglin Temple in China practiced the visualization of Amitabha together with the intention of gaining rebirth in Sukhavati, the Western Paradise. The emphasis of their practice was the visualization, not the repetition of his name, which came a bit later. The practice of devotion Amitabha also became part of the Tiantai school from its inception. The founder of Tiantai, Shigi, made the Pure Land Buddhism an integral part of the system of meditative practice. Shigi's major work, the Makashikan, described four kinds of meditation practice, constantly sitting, constantly walking, both walking and sitting, and neither walking nor sitting. The constant walking meditation practice was based upon the Pratyapana Sutra, and it consisted of circumambulating the statue of Amitabha or Amida as and chanting his name and visualizing him, as we mentioned a few moments ago. So that's really as integral to, to Tiantai uh, Buddhism as one can get. Um, during the Sung Dynasty, there were a large-scale recitation society with thousands of members formed under the auspices of Tiantai masters. What I mean by, by um, these recitation societies, imagine the group of people that we had here. Instead of getting together to do what we're doing tonight, we would all get together and we would sit and recitate and do recitations of Anitaofu, which is the Chinese pronunciation of, of Amida Buddha. And so it, over and over and over again, it became a kind of, of practice and people visualizing Amida Buddha as a way of attaining rebirth in the Pure Land. Next, please. To bring it into Japan, we have the founder of Tendai Buddhism. Now, Pure Land teachings had been in Japan previous to Saicho, that is to say, the sutras and some of the ideas, but they were never really actualized. They were never really acted upon. So it was really uh, Dengyo Daishi, Saicho, the founder, who 
ordained in Kokobunji Temple and returned to his native Omi province to establish a hermitage on Mount Tie in 785. He lived there for 13 years. We're all aware of that character if you've been at the Dharma Center very long. And his public lectures on the Lotus Sutra came to the attention of the Wake clan in the imperial court. And so in 804, he petitioned Emperor Kanmu to travel to China for advanced Buddhist studies. That's a little, that's the way it's given. What actually happened was he petitioned Emperor Kanmu to have two of his disciples go to China and get the teachings. And the emperor said, why don't you go? <laughs> why are you getting your disciples to go? So he went with, with, one, other, with one other disciple. And while in China, he received the full Tiantai transmission. He also received a t transmission of the Oxhead School of Chan of Zen, Southern School of Zen. And he also received the teachings of Japanese Mikyo or the esoteric, the esoteric teachings. Um, he established the monastery and petitioned petition for the ordination platform, which was granted shortly after his death. Um, and he lobbied the imperial court for establishment of Tendai as a separate tradition in Japan with annual ordinance. And I want to explain that just a little bit. When we talk about the ordination platform in Japan at that time, there were six schools of Buddhism in Nara, Japan, which at the time, um, be, shortly before this, before the four, was the capital of Japan. And while the, there was other Buddhism that was around Japan, however, those six schools were the ruling schools. <clears throat> and they were given subsidies by the imperial court to operate their monasteries which really kept them going. And that when we, so when we talk about petitioning for an ordination platform, it meant that rather than being ordained, um, Shin, uh, Saicho himself was ordained at Todaiji Temple in Nara. Um, that, was the, that was one of the ordination platforms. That was the main ordination platform. That's where you went to, you may have trained someplace else, but that's where you went to be ordained. He wanted to do this in another place, and just to fill that out a little bit, a little bit more, he also wanted to abandon the Vinaya, which are the rules of discipline, the 250 rules for men and 320 or so rules for women, that the um, that were the the basis for discipline of all the schools at that time, and he wanted to put in place uh, the 10 major and 48 minor vows. Of the, referred to as the Bodhisattva vows that we take to this day. That transformed Buddhism in Japan, that very act, because it meant that all the other schools of Buddhism now, to this day, that developed since that time, all take the Bodhisattva vows, not the Vinaya vows. And part of the reason for that, very briefly, I'm just taking a little tangent here because I think it's, it's really interesting to note, Part of the reason for that, for the, the change from Saito's perspective, there were a number of different reasons, but one of the reasons had to do with um, he was trying to establish a Japanese school of Buddhism. Not a Chinese, up until that point, all the schools of Buddhism were based upon Chinese teachings and Chinese masters coming over to uh, Japan or Korean in some cases, well, not Korean, but Chike, the forerunner of Korea, who were giving the teachings. And so it was really mimicking the Chinese form. And Saicho, for a number of reasons, I won't go into with the petition, petitioned to have his own ordination platform and petitioned not to follow the same ordination vows as the other schools. One of those six schools, by the way, of Nara Buddhism is called Ritsu, and Ritsu is just a transliteration of the term Vinaya. It's a Japanese transliteration of Vinaya. So um, Tendai was then established uh, by imperial decree, and the petition to or to permission for ordination actually didn't occur until several months after his death. It's like they're waiting for him to die before they would put it into place. 
but it did take place. Uh, and uh, that was in 822. So the Tiantai school was a repository and transmitter of meditative techniques and the meditation directed toward Amida and rebirth in Sukhavati were among the techniques introduced through Saicho upon his return from Japan. And so what's important about this is while the ideas of the Pure Land had been present in Japan, some of the sutras were present in Japan, it was never acted upon. But through Tiantai, Tiantai, it was integral to the Tiantai teachings. So when Saicho brought the Tiantai teachings to Japan, he included those as one of the major components of that broader teaching, which we think of as Tendai today. So we're going to go to Pure Land during the Heian era. And by the way, the, the term Heian era is that period of time, 494 to 1185. And it makes re that's a reference to Mount Hiei, because that was the dominant school at that time. And we have there a picture of any on the right referred to as Jikaku Daishi. Uh, and from 835 to 847, Enin studied and traveled around China collecting texts, treatises, and ritual manuals. Saicho was in Japan for approximately nine months, by contrast. Um, and Enin was thus responsible for transmitting far more than just in terms of the intellectual material culture than any monk before him, and I'll comment about that in a moment. That transmission of Tang Buddhism culture profoundly transformed Japanese Buddhism. It also transformed Chinese Buddhism in a way that you, would, you wouldn't expect, because during the latter part of the Tang, Buddhism was persecuted. And during that persecution, temples were burned, burned to the ground, priests were killed, sent out of the temples and all the material i shouldn't say all the material but most of the material that had been chinese buddhist material had been lost but because of jikaku's travels and bringing all those materials back to japan those materials could be reintroduced at a later time there's a journal of of jikaku's travels that's really fascinating to read that that he wrote during that during that period, um, it's available under uh, actually one one of our good friends, um, Saito uh, Enshin wrote uh, did a translation with an introduction that's really fascinating. Someone would like to see it sometime. I'd make it available. Anyway, uh, Jikaku Daishi became the third Zasu. Zasu is the head of Tendai uh, Tendai Buddhism, and he's in credited with introducing Pure Land practices formally into the Tendai practices in Japan, especially the constantly walking meditation while visualizing and recitation of Nembutsu, Namo Mirabutsu. Up until this time, uh, and, and this set the stage for the subsequent develops of Pure Land philosophy and practices, and up until this time, the Amida or Pure Land practitioner were seen as cults. They were groups of people who really were uh, devoted to Amida Buddha, and, but they were really small. They weren't part of formal Buddhist uh, structure. They, they were, as I say, cults. Um, and Kyuyo, and, and some, though some of them were very popular, and one of, the, one of the really popular people that I wanted to mention is the figure that you see on the right hand side, the statue of the figure on the right hand side, is Okuya uh, from 903 to, 9, to uh, 972. He was the first Japanese Jerry, itinerant monk, would be um, uh, similar to um, what Shakyamuni Buddha did wandering from village to village. Um, he's famous for preaching in the marketplace, for which he became known as the holy man in the marketplace. And he wandered from town to town where he begged for alms that he didn't then use himself. He gave the alms to the poor. He preached in prisons. He had roads smoothed out. He buried abandoned corpses. He dug wells. He built bridges. 
you would say that he was one of those monks who was going out in the world not to preach, but to do through various good works. So Kuya received a full ordination as a Tendai monk in 948. Uh, the picture is, is of a statue. It's one of my favorite uh, statues in Japan. And it's a picture of Kuya. I don't know if you can see it in the back, but it's a picture of, of Kuyo, a Kuya, who's reciting Nembutsu, and you'll see six um, images of Buddha coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. And those six um, Buddhas are his words of Nembutsu. According to Jodo Shu, one has to recite Nem Amida Butsu six times with full sincerity, which will take one to the pure land. So that's what it's it's in reference to. And that's, that particular statue is housed in a temple in Kyoto called um, Roku Haramitsu, Haramitsu-ji in Kyoto. Um, so this is perhaps most important. This next slide is most important to the development of Pure Land thought in Tendai, but also in Japan. Next, please. And I'm going to start with, this is Genshin, or Ishin Sozu, and you see his dates there. And I mention him for several reasons. The first is that he was seminal in development of Pure Land thought in Tendai in Japan. And he was also an exemplary example of what Saicho and Tendai intended for monks, which we'll get to in a moment. Lastly, his writings were highly influential for Honin and Shinran, the founders of Jodo Shu and Jodo Shinshu, respectively. He was a Tendai monk who was considered one of the patriarchs of those, of those schools. And he was born in Yamato province, uh, which is now Nara, and his father Masachika was not particularly religious, whereas his mother was a pious Buddhist nun who eventually, um, uh, and his sister, his elder sister also became a relatively famous nun. And he was a disciple of the now famous Gyogen. Gyogen was a Zasu who was famous for his debates and one of the spiritual protectors of the emperor. He became the 18th Zasu and was during a very critical period of Tendai development. He realized, he revitalized Tendai after a period of decline. So sometime I have to talk just about Yogan because he's such a very interesting character. Uh, he was really uh, responsible for, um, I think, Tendai being much of what it is today in many ways. Um, he also became a recluse in Yokawa, which I'll talk about more in a moment, at a relatively early age. And though he was a favored participant in the ceremonies on Mount Hiei, he eschewed a successful career to spend the rest of his life as a recluse in Yokawa. It is said that his mother scolded Genshin for participating with wealthy lay patrons and forgetting a monk's primary duties of cultivating his own spirituality. You know, I didn't know that they had Jewish mothers at that time, but apparently in Japan they did. And he was, his first piece of writing was the Byakogu Kambo, which is the first piece of writing on the Pure Land. This is a method for contemplating Amida's Byakugo, or the 32 marks that adorn the body of all Buddhas, specifically visualizing between his eyebrows until you see it quite clearly and distinctively. And when you visualize, then all the 84,000 physical characteristics will, of a Buddha will spontaneously manifest and you'll see Amida when this occurs. Innumerable Buddhas of the Ten Directions will also be seen. Having visualized these innumerable Buddhas, you've received from each a prediction of your future Buddhahood. And this is the general perception of the physical characteristics of the Buddha and is known as the Ninth Contemplation. The founder of Ishin, he was the founder of the Ishin School of Tendai and Nijugo Zanmai, the latter is the deathbed Nimbutsu. The deathbed Nimbutsu stipulates that members conduct this uh, recitation 
at the, at the hour of one's death. One recites it oneself if one realizes that one is dying, but others will recite it for you if, if that's not possible. In order to successfully obtain rebirth in the Pure Land, and at the time of its creation in the 10th, 10th century, it was only a fellowship of 25 members, but it really became a really very popular um, feature. Next, please. Genshin started the Ojo Yoshu uh, in the 11th month of 984 and he completed in the fourth month of 985 when he secluded himself in Yokawa, uh, at which time he immersed himself in the Pure Land teachings. Yokawa is the remotest of the several precincts of Mount Iye. Todo and Saito are the centerpieces of Mount Iye, whereas Yoko is more than five kilometers from these other two precincts, down and up several peaks, um, and is the northernmost precinct, and it's primarily used for hermitages. Its most famous temple is Churyogon, the hall and practice of meditation of heroic valor. And, and people may not be aware of Mount Hie, but Mount Hie is, you know, when we talk about the Berkshires, Mount Hie is more like talking about the Berkshires. Um, and I mean, it's, it's not a dramatically high mountain like you'd find in Tibet, but it's it, the, the peak where Anrod Pijia is located is about, I think it's 820 meters, so it's about 2,500 feet, something like that. Um, a little bit over that probably. But, so it's not as dramatic as the Himalayas. It's more gentle, like the Berkshire, like the Berkshires, and it sort of covers a broad area. Um, so it's not a single peak, it's it, several peaks over a broader area. And you have those three specific areas that I just mentioned. Um, so underlying the entire Pure Land system of Ojoshu, Ojo Yoshu, I want to pronounce that correctly, is Genshin's conviction that the world is in the midst of the defiled latter age called Mapo in Japanese. Mapo, I'm not going to go into to detail at this time, but briefly, it's a period in which spiritual capacities of people have declined to the point where they can no longer possibly attain Buddhahood by relying solely on one's innate powers and abilities. In other words, up until Mapo, there were three ages to let you know. There were three ages. The age of the tr true Dharma, which was the period, and there's different periods of time of how we uh, designate these 500 years in one system, a thousand years in another system. This was the period of time in which Shakyamuni Buddha taught, his disciples taught, his disciples' disciples taught, etc. After about 500 years, it was felt that the true Dharma would have been diminished by its distance from the origin of the teaching, you know, the chronologic distance. And then the second period of time is the period of the imitative Dharma, in which the true Dharma, that most immediate, and by the way, when we're talking about that, we're getting on to what we talk about when, we, when we're talking about mind-to-mind -mind transmission, you know, from my mind to your mind, Chakramana Buddha's mind to his disciples' mind. Um, we go on to the imitative period in which it's far enough from the origin of the teaching so that, it's getting late, um, so that the teachings are no longer as immediate. People have to work harder. Uh, the priests have to be more interpretive. Um, it's farther away. Now, <clears throat> keeping in mind that at the time of Saicho, it was felt that Shakyamuni Buddha would have lived at a time which would now be dated to about 940 some odd years. Um, uh, I'm sorry, 940 some odd uh, BCE. We now think Shakyamuni Buddha lived either in the fifth uh, century or fourth century BCE, depending upon who's doing the counting. Um, but that's the idea of coming into, meaning in Japan, coming into Mapo meant it was right around the corner. It's upon us. This period of the degenerate dharmas is going to be here. And so therefore, 
Reliance upon one's own powers, which is called jariki in Japanese, is not as possible. That means meditation, doing uh, various types of, of practices per se. You couldn't do it on your own. You need something else. Genshin lamented that though time-honored exoteric and esoteric forms of spiritual cultivation could be effective for those monks who are diligent and blessed with great intelligence, it would not be possible for someone who was as dull as he, he was, especially since they were on the threshold of this latter period of Dharma. So he, he was modestly saying, I'm pretty dull, I can't get it. Um, um, I'm going to have to find some other way to be awakened. And so he considered rebirth in the Pure Land not as an end in and of itself. It, you know, it, when we think of the Pure Land, when you read the text, it reads like a heavenly place. Well, heavenly if you happen to be a sixth century Chinese, I suppose. But because it's pretty, you know, the, 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 the streams run with lapis lazuli and jade hangs from the trees and the, the paths are paved with silver and da 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 You know, I think it sounds like a pretty cold place, personally. I, I, I much prefer a forest, right? Yeah. Um, so, but he saw it as a step toward Buddhahood. And what's <laughs> especially important about this is that uh, once one got to the Pure Land, one would become a bodhisattva, and now one is reborn to work for the benefit of others. If you see the distinction, it's not an eternal heaven. It's a, it's a, a shortcut to bodhisattvahood, if you will. Um, so while tadeki, dependence on the power of the other, in this case, we're talking about Amida, if we're talking about Pure Land, is required in this latter period, Jidiki is still necessary, and that's the, the Tendai view today, is that both Jidiki and Tadiki, the other power and one's own power, are both necessary, that you require both, not one or the other. Some schools still argue one or the other, either one's own power. The Zen schools are concentrating on one's own power. The Pure Land schools concentrate on the other power. Uh, in the 10th century, um, Genshin argues the efficacy of the Nembutsu practice derives from four powers. The power of one's past merits, the power of one's desires to see birth in the Pure Land, and the sustaining power of meeting one's vows and nurturing support of the Holy Sages. Um, I think I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because we're running out of time. Um, so what I want to point out here is that Nembutsu can refer to a variety of practices from the sublime contemplation of Amidas as a, an image constructed in a state of samadhi to a less difficult act of just reciting Namo Amida Butsu. And Ojo, Ojo Yoshu is the starting point of all contemporary views of the Pure Land philosophy, so we can owe that to uh, Genshin. Next, please. If we look at the contemporary perspective, <coughs> Uh, a note on the picture of Zenkoji, which you see there, and I want to make two comments about that. It was founded before Buddhism in Japan split into two different sects, and currently belongs to both Tendai and Jodo Shu sect. I've shown you two temples that are actually by two different sects of Buddhism. They're both Tendai and Jodo Shu. Uh, and in the case of this particular temple, um, there are 25 priests from Jeroshu and 14 priests from Tendai that co-manage space. And the another point that I wanted to make is if you look carefully at the picture, you'll see a swastika. And many of us have been working to rehabilitate the image of the swastika because the swastika is a sacred symbol to Hindus and to Buddhists. And of course, because of its reputation by the Nazis, who never called it the swastika, they called it the Hockenkreuz, the hook cross, mm -hmm. uh, that's often mistaken. We think that they're the same thing. And, but if you go to Japan and you're looking for a particular temple, and you'll see sometimes they'll have the name in, in Romanji and in, in you know, Roman characters, 
and there'll be a swastika associated with it because that's how you designate a temple. Mm. Or if you look at a map, you'll see um, Tori, which are the, the, the sort of gateway of Shinto mm. and or Shinto shrines, and you'll see a swastika designating mm. Buddhist temples. Um, the Hibitsu, or the main image of Zenkoji, was brought from India to Japan by way of the Korean Peninsula in the 6th century during the reign of Emperor Kinma, Kinmai, and afterwards it was moved several times before coming to rest at the present site at this particular temple in Nagano City, and it's thought to be the first Buddhist statue in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, next please. <coughs> <coughs> If we're talking now, oh, I think I go back. Oh, we missed a slide. Oh, I know. I forgot to mention markless practice. Uh, the markless practice is the contemporary perspective on um, the pure land within Tendai. Even while remain, I'll read the whole thing. One part it's there. Even while remaining mindful of the Buddha by reciting his name and seeking the pure land, contemplated in the following way. To meet his body and land are ultimately empty, like mirages or dreams. Although they are identical with their substance, they are empty. While empty they exist, they are neither existent nor empty. To realize this non-duality and truly enter the supreme truth, this is called the markless Nembutsu, and this is the supreme Samadhi, Samadhi meaning meditation. This statement is the contemporary view that is consistent between Pure Land teachings and the three truths as one truth in Tendai philosophy practice. That would be okay. By the way, Rob, can you see everything? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, although it's too late to change it now. So. Yeah. Um, in conclusion, Tendai is devoted to the idea that there's no single way or practice toward awakening. Pure Land teachings are one of many. There are many excellent methods of practice that will lead to awakening. Furthermore, each temple or even region in Japan has embedded within it its own tradition into history that leads each Jushoku, each abbot of that particular temple to be committed to a specific philosophy and sets of practices. Thus, you would find some temples that are devoted to Mikyo or esoteric practices, and they would do something like the fire or the Goma ceremony that, that we had here last week. And they might do this once a month, sometimes a couple of times a year, etc. There are other temples that are dedicated to meditation, and they'll be conducting Shikan meditation on a consistent basis. Yet others may be devoted to the Pure Land, both philosophically and by virtue of practice. And Ichishima Sensei's father was one of those. If you went into Ichishima Sensei's home temple, Senzoji, you would think that you might be in a Pure Land temple. Amida was the main image, and it was set up in, uh, in that fashion. On the other hand, Tamonin, which was one of the other temples of, of the Ichishima family, is a Mikyo temple. Bishamonten is the main image, the Honzon, in that temple. You know, so you see how within Tendai, it's not a single set of practices. Each place may do many. So some temples are devoted to various forms of chanting practice. And that becomes their focus. Yet others are primarily more scholar monks who will include all of the practices above, but will spend more time on scholarship. On Hiezan itself, there are many temples, and each of these temples has a particular devotion and set of practices that reflects the practices above that we just talked about, such as the Sunichi Kaihogyo or Thousand Day Pilgrimage um, that we've spoken about many times. Each Tendai Soryo who trains at Enrakuji on Yezan in Japan or at Tendai Shu New York Betsuin must demonstrate confidence in all these areas. But all the temples in Sangha will be participating in pure lane teaching in one way or another. Next, please. And so very quickly, um, these are the sources that I use for the, this evening's discussion. And if anybody's interested in those, you're certainly welcome to them. And why don't we go to the next slide? 